Hey guys, welcome back to Installation 00. This one has been a long time coming. In today's most detailed breakdown, we're looking at the semi-powered infiltration armour used predominantly by the Spartan 3s. I'm going to say this at the onset, there is relatively scarce information on the particulars of SPI armour, so in order to make this video worthy of being called a most detailed breakdown, I'm going to have to extrapolate some of the features based on what is and is not possible in the Halo universe at the time of the suit's creation. In certain areas where there is a considerable lack of information, I will make some informed decisions to extrapolate to the best of my ability features of the suit based on current, real-world cutting-edge scientific possibilities. I feel it's worth mentioning now as a way to somewhat validate my assumptions during this particular most detailed breakdown that I am trained and qualified in electronics, computer engineering, computer science, material science and engineering processes. On top of this, I'm also an autodidact polymath, meaning I can, I'm self-taught on a number of subjects highly applicable to the technological precursors of what we find in the Halo universe. I wanted you all to know this in advance so that you understand my reasoning when extrapolating certain areas that are lacking on canonical detail. With this in mind, I will remain as close and as loyal to the canon as humanly possible, but there will be some details featured in this video which, while not specifically written in the canon, is a viable and well-considered explanation of those features. For example, nowhere in any of the lore is it specified the way in which gravity behaves, or what the speed of light is, or the material properties of iron, yet we accept it at face value to be consistent with our real-world analogues. The same manner will be applied to the features lacking of specific detail in this video. While I'm on the subject, we will also continue with our outside-in modus operandi for analysis, breaking down every component as and when we come across them. So, with all that now out in the open, I'm going to shut the hell up justify myself and get to the content you came here for. Roll the title card. Described as part legionnaire male, part tactical body armour and part chameleon, the semi-powered infiltration armour, or SPI, was developed in tandem with the Spartan 3 programme. It is a UNSC combat armour system designed with an emphasis on stealth through the use of special photoreactive panels. The armour was developed by the Watershed Division with Ruck Ariostin as design lead, as a cheaper, more mass-producible armour system for the upcoming Spartan 3 candidates. The Spartan 3s were conceived as disposable soldiers set on high-risk missions for high strategic value objectives, outwardly accepted as suicide missions. As such, the Office of Naval Intelligence were trading lives for time as the war with the Covenant worsened. It was because of this that emphasis was put on cost saving with the Spartan 3 program and the SPI armour system. Although early versions of the SPI system were tested by ODSTs, the armour was most prominently issued to the Spartan 3 super soldiers, with over 2,000 units of SPI armour manufactured during the Human Covenant War. The SPI armour had been mostly phased out of use by the Spartan 3s by 2558 in favour of Mjolnir. However, SPI continues to fill a usage niche in covert roles, particularly within Oni. The Spartan 3s in Vita Lopez's ferret team often used SPI instead of Mjolnir, due to the former's superior stealth capabilities. The Mark I SPI armour was developed on a tight budget and tight time constraints, having to outfit all 300 Alpha Company Spartan 3s before their deployment onto the suicide mission co-named Operation Prometheus. Improvements were made to the Mark I platform for application to Beta Company, resulting in the particular iteration of SPI armour that we will now look at in detail, the Mark II SPI armour. The differences from 1 to 2 being significant, but ultimately and simply improvements on systems that were already in situ, rather than implementation of completely new technology. So let's now start our analysis by looking at the outer plating. The outer shell of the SPI armour comprises a series of lightweight laminate plates with a photoreactive coating. The plates are a composite laminate, meaning that they are an assembly of layers of composite materials which are joined to provide required engineering properties including in-plane stiffness, bending stiffness, strength, and coefficient of thermal expansion. They are grey or olive green in colour, but have been known to be more ornately coloured, but this is generally thought to be an unnecessary aesthetic choice given that the suit's primary function is to be invisible. The composite materials used for the plates include carbon nanofiber reinforced polymers evidenced by the armour's resistance to heat, the polymer in question likely being ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, or a close analogue, and titanium diboride which is an alloy of titanium and boron which is known to be an extremely hard ceramic which has good thermal conductivity and is a reasonable electrical conductor. 
These properties are desirable as the plates have built-in temperature regulation systems which enables the armour systems to automatically adjust the surface temperature of the plates to match that of the environment, rendering the suit practically invisible to infrared or heat-seeking imaging. Semiconducting filaments inlaid within the composite armour's outer shell make use of the Peltier effect by using electricity that passes between a junction between two semiconductors to either draw heat away, thereby cooling the armour surface, or heating the surface up. The intended operational range being from near freezing to about 40 degrees centigrade, as with an expected atmospheric temperature gradient. The electrical conductivity of titanium diboride is useful in regards to the photoreactive coating, facilitating the camouflaging functionality. The photoreactive panels act as active camouflage when in use, effectively blending the wearer with their environment. The coating acts similarly to a chameleon skin in that chameleons have two superimposed layers within their skin that control their colour and thermoregulation. The top layer contains a lattice of guanine nanocrystals, and by exciting this lattice, the spaces between the nanocrystals can be manipulated, which in turn affects which wavelengths of light are reflected and which are absorbed. Exciting the lattice increases the distance between the nanocrystals and the skin reflects longer wavelengths of light. Thus, in a relaxed state, the crystals reflect blues and greens. But in an excited state, the longer wavelengths such as yellows, oranges and reds are reflected. The coating achieves this by having three layers, the outermost layer being a protective, optically translucent layer, allowing surrounding light to penetrate through. The second being a nano-crystalline matrix with embedded nano-optical sensors, and the third innermost layer being an electrically conductive positive feedback circuit. The ambient hue of light passes through the protective layer and excites the optical sensors in a very specific response to the wavelength of light it receives. This excitation is detected by an underlying feedback circuit which then attenuates, moderates and transmits this signal pattern across the surface of the photoreactive panels causing the rest of the crystalline matrix to adjust its nanoscale topography to reflect light of the same wavelength detected, while absorbing the rest. The downside to this camouflage technology is its sensitivity. Even glancing blows from weapons or plasma or sudden photosaturation, as is the case with flashbang grenades, the system almost instantly overloads and shuts down revealing the Spartan 3 to hostiles and taking a while to recover afterward. To play to the suit's photoreactive panels, the SPI armour makes use of a more organic design with smooth curved armour plates free of any particularly harsh angles or bevels to enable the suit to more seamlessly blend with its surroundings. These plates cover the entire body with provisions made for freedom of movement to compensate for the massively reduced strength and speed enhancement technology used as opposed to the Mjolnir project line. Consequently, the SPI armour can be worn by any individual and does not require special neurological, skeletal or muscular augmentation technology. As with the unaugmented instructors of the Spartan 3 trainees, the SPI armour is not as bulky or as heavy as Mjolnir, although the plating material is also less durable, as evidenced when Kelly 087 dented a Spartan 3's chest plate with her fist when encountering the Spartan 3 on Onyx for the first time. The plating is connected to the underlying layers via the SPI exoframe, a rigid support structure made of titanium, which is fully articulated allowing full range of motion of the wearer by means of allowing the various plates to slide over one another, while also directing the weight of the armour through the exoframe and into the soles of the boots, thereby relieving the wearer of the weight of the armour. The SPI exoframe also possesses modest strength and speed enhancement technology, the system is passive, meaning that it works on the basis of the wearer's own strength and simply adds to it via a series of actuators, rather than picking up nervous impulses or neural interfaces to interpret movement ahead of time. The actuators are purely mechanical in function as opposed to Mjolnir's amorphous liquid crystal to save on cost and energy requirements. Exceptions to this are the Rift class gauntlets and the tactile braces. The rifts are shock resistant and force amplifying. The gauntlets are mechanically connected to the SPI exoframe just behind the wrist via an adjustable fixture, meaning the gauntlet is held in suspension mere millimetres away from the knuckles of the user, allowing the force of a blow to be transferred exclusively through the armour rather than the body of the wearer. It is expected a sheer thickening fluid is also employed to assist in impact dampening at the knuckles. 
This may have been the inspiration for naming the Rift class gauntlets, as there exists a gap or rift between the user's knuckles and the knuckles of the gauntlet. Over the wrist there is also an armour piece which covers some force amplification servos, allowing the user to strike considerably harder than the armour would otherwise enable them to do, closing the strike force gap between Mjolnir and SPI, though not completely. The armor's gauntlet also features a data port to which small electronic devices such as data pads can be connected. The tactile bracers are a set of four plates over the boots which are all articulated and interconnected with an array of actuators granting the wearer modest improvements to speed and the dexterity of the foot. This allows the wearer more sure footing on uneven surfaces as the boots are significantly more mobile than they would be with a simple hinged armor plating and giving the wearer some force feedback to add additional power and speed to their stride without sacrificing the armor's protection at the ankles and maintaining a smooth form factor for the camouflage system. The SPI armor also generally lacks an energy shield system, making the user far more vulnerable to enemy fire. However, the Spartan III Headhunters wore experimental armor that was equipped with energy shields due to their elite nature and value. However, power must be drawn from the energy shields to recharge this suit's active camouflage module. In the back of the torso armor is the primary power cell of the SPI armor set, a low-profile shielded BA-55901 PLMD battery cell is located between the shoulder blades beneath a triangular-like covering plate. This battery is a long store battery with a high energy density able to produce power for the SPI armor for extended periods of time. While it is capable of producing all the energy needed to power the suit, it doesn't have anywhere close to the lifespan or energy density of the power source of Mjolnir, being a micronuclear fusion pack. Very little else is known about these batteries' properties. There is a similarly named battery cell that powered the older Halo 3 era Spartan laser. If it were the same battery cell, I would have explored the power output of the Spartan laser to ascertain the battery's power density, then used that to extrapolate SPI armor's power requirements, but as they have completely different series numbers, I do not feel confident that it will be reliable information. Under the suit's armour plates and photoactive panels, we come across the tech suit. The suit is composed of a layered mesh of ballistic liquid nanocrystal that is significantly more effective than traditional body armour materials such as Kevlar, while being less bulky. Ballistic liquid nanocrystal is another way to say a dilent liquid armour. A dilent armour, otherwise known as a shear thickening fluid, are a non-Newtonian fluid containing suspended nanocrystalline particles of ceramic. When a shear force is exerted against the fluid, the particles within the fluid form an almost instantaneous crystalline matrix, hardening the fluid to 98% the mechanical strength of the associated ceramic material in the blink of an eye, thereby acting as a liquid armour. The induced crystalline matrix relaxing and returning to its normal viscosity nearly immediately afterward. This suit also contains a hermetic seal, allowing the suits to operate in vacuum and toxic environments. The pressured internal environment required for survival is actually provided by mechanical back pressure. The suit is designed to apply mechanical pressure to the wearer's body to keep them comfortable and operationally effective in vacuum. This also means that the oxygen supply for the wearer need only be provided within the helmet rather than the entire body, as the body is already experiencing back pressure. The suit also contains a small oxygen reserve for around 7 minutes, and judging by the bulk around the rear of the helmet, it is likely the small oxygen tanks are located within the helmet. The tech suit's leggings and sleeves can be removed independently, assisting the wearer in modularity and ability to swap out components on the field. Like Mjolnir, the SPI armor has dedicated ports allowing for quick injection of biofoam or other battlefield pharmaceuticals. These were seldom used as the Spartan 3s were generally sent on suicide missions and were augmented to operate far beyond the point that shock would have incapacitated any other person, even Spartan 2s. Next we come to the skin tight environment suit, which possesses rudimentary environmental regulation systems to maintain a comfortable temperature for the wearer. It actively heats and cools the internal climate to keep the wearer at an optimal operating temperature. However, the system is not designed for extensive use, and it will become increasingly uncomfortable to wear if it is continually used over long periods of time. This is due to the nature of the temperature regulation system being, similarly to the armor plates, based on the Peltier effect. This means that although cooling the system works effectively at the onset, it does so by re redirecting heat with the flow of electricity to the positive side of the semiconducting Peltier heat pumps, 
Over time, the heat on the positive terminal backfeeds to the cool side and thus cancels out the cooling process. This creates a gradual temperature gradient and although the skin tight suit is designed to be moisture wicking, drawing sweat away from the body, over time the suit can become saturated and begin to cling, catch and rub against the wearer's skin, making it particularly uncomfortable. Spartan 3s have been witnessed at removing their helmets and sections of their armour during operations when opportunity arises to try to reduce their temperature and allow the suit to vent somewhat. Finally, the helmet. The default headgear for the SPI armour is the Mirage class helmet featuring a large bulbous faceplate somewhat similar to that of Mjolnir's EVA variant. The visor is normally gold mirrored in colour and can be depolarised. The depolarising function is achieved oddly very similarly to modern day LCD displays using polarising liquid crystal. These nanocrystals can be reoriented by passing a charge through the dual layers of the visor, instantly polarizing or depolarizing the visor. A similar technology was also used in the ODST helmets. The helmet supports a heads-up display with features similar to that of Mjolnir's system, including a TAC map, team bio and team comm interface, and team status lights. A motion tracker suite utilizing a quantum mirror for ultra-fine tracking resolution allows the user information on any moving targets within a 15 meter radius. The helmet contains ultra clear audio, microphone array and auxiliary loudspeaker systems for close proximity conversation, air intake and exhaust ports to help with defogging and reduce internal moisture and humidity levels, as well as filtering the air of toxic materials using HEPA, HEGA and ULPA filters. The helmet contains an electronic compass with a digital readout at the apex of the HUD, showing the cardinal direction the wearer's head is facing. There are air quality sensors and absolute pressure sensors that link to the suit systems and make decisions to lock the suit's external vents if the pressure drops below a certain point or the quality of air reaching the wearer deteriorates. And a tactical torch allows for operation in darkened environments, although with Spartans, occipital capillary reversal augments and thus their ability to see in the perpetual darkness, it's rarely used by Spartans. The visor suite features an automatic magnification and an image enhancement system controlled by the wearer's eye movement. For example, if the wearer squints while looking at a particular spot, the system will automatically zoom in. Both the image enhancement and the visor's internal polarization can also be controlled manually. The helmet also holds its own hermetic seal that maintains a breathable atmosphere within the helmet should the suit enter a vacuum or toxic environment. All in all, the SPI systems are very bare bones, but still surprisingly effective combat systems, given that the SPI suits were made as cheaply as was practically possible, given the nature of the disposable soldier methodology Colonel James Ackerson adopted for the Spartan 3 program. The suits, while not widely used, are still in service, and in some cases improvements have been made to even the Mark II suits, whereby the SPI armor generally lacks an energy shielding system, making the user far more vulnerable to enemy fire. As previously mentioned, Spartan III Headhunters wore experimental armor that was equipped with energy shields due to their elite nature. And this design innovation was a compromise, however, as the power had to be drawn from the energy shields to recharge the active camouflage module. The SPI armor, as utilized by the Spartan 3s, is a fantastic example of what desperate times and desperate measures can result in. Although the operations that the Spartans of Alpha and Beta companies undertook cost practically every single soul in the successful but ultimately costly endeavor, the SPI armor performed its job effectively. The improvements that led to the Mark II that then went into service with Gamma Company not only greatly improved the combat effectiveness of the Gammas, but was also so well received that it is still in service today. Camouflage systems and an organic form factor with the large faceless mirrored visor instilled fear and dread in the enemy, appearing as ghostly phantom, fighting with a motivation and fury even the Spartan 2s lack. The SPI epitomizes the Spartan 3s and makes for one of the more unique and interesting armor sets in the UNSC. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below. I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons, Miguel, Brian, and Sebastian, the holders of the mantle, Justin and Zach, my Metarchs, and all of the other patrons that have jumped aboard to help support the channel. 
If you like Halo lore discussed to insane levels of detail, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. If you really love the channel, consider popping over to Patreon and give whatever support you can over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more time for me to put into this content and other Halo related goodness. Take it easy everyone, find peace in the domain.